Wearing an empty look in his eyes, a young man mercilessly took someone's life. In retrospect, he said things would finally end. Following his narrative, he was a killer or more accurately, an avenger. Surrounded by the lifeless bodies of the criminals, he put the law into his hands and punished them himself. That said, what he accomplished did not make him any different from his victims. He spent five years bringing his plan to fruition, but despite the successful revenge, he couldn't feel any sense of fulfillment. As his resolve, he ended the cycle of revenge by using the weapon on himself. As he lost consciousness, his journey finally reached its conclusion, or so he thought. Amidst the awakening, a mysterious voice lingers in his ears, saying it's a waste of his life, and before he knows it, he is awake. Looking at his surroundings, he felt confused as he was supposed to be inside an abandoned building. Even more so, the wound on his neck has healed, and all his other belongings are gone. Interestingly enough, he still has his knife. For the second time, without hesitating, he attempts to finish himself off, but somehow, the knife gets reduced to smithereens. Wondering what's happening, someone calls for his attention. At that moment, a beautiful girl enters the picture, revealing that she just used magic to stop him. Introducing herself as Shiro, she asks the boy's name. Rather than introduce himself, he questions where he is and if everything that's happening is real. To his dismay, she won't answer any of his questions until he states his name. He finally introduces himself as Kirono, to which Shiro suggests shortening it to Kiro because Japanese names in that world are not common. Hearing this, he desperately wants to know where in the world he really is. Shiro shares that Kiro is an otherworlder, and his case of being reincarnated there is not rare. There and then, he realizes that he is neither in Japan nor on Earth in general. Seeing him reacting a bit nonchalantly, she mentions he would have been cuter if he acted more surprised. For the record, Shiro is also an otherworlder, and she will be his guide in his new world. Kiro then asks why she had to intervene earlier. She notes that to maintain the fairness of any game, there's a warning before the player starts. As she keeps beating around the bush, he steals her dagger and points it at her. While he demands a clear answer, she raises both her hands and asks why he has to do it. Kiro reminds Shiro to mind her own business, to which she says she has a reason to stop him. As she puts it, it's a waste of his life. She reveals that every single otherworlder has heard a mysterious voice almost saying the same thing. If anything, when Shiro died from an accident, she heard that it was a pity, while Kiro heard it was a waste because he took his life with his own hands. While he still processes his thoughts and emotions, she explains his current situation further. According to Shiro, they are living in a world called Arculia. With several cases of otherworldly reincarnations, the place is an entirely different one compared to their previous world. She adds that there are two things people agree on, the first one is the voice, but when she's about to mention the second one, she cups his cheek, telling him how unfortunate he is. Having been granted another shot at life, she tries to convince him to live happily this time. At that instant, an image of a girl, seemingly suffering from a deplorable situation, flashes before his eyes. When Shiro volunteers to show him around the city, Kiro grabs her arm and asks if she knows anyone with the name Toa. Switching to a brief flashback, Kiro had a twin sister. Aside from having a beautiful face, she has a bright personality which made her popular. On the other hand, Kiro was the total opposite, but he couldn't care less. As a proud brother, he called Toa his excellent and cute little sister. Their admirable affection for each other wouldn't last, however. She was killed and by the time the young Kiro caught up to the scene, it was too late. After what happened, he was never the same, and since then, his vibrant smile left his face. For a second, he thought of immediately joining Toa in the afterlife. But then, he couldn't just ignore the people responsible for his sister's demise. For this reason, he sought revenge, and justice has been served, at least in his eyes. Everything was going according to his plan, and he was ready to meet his maker. Little did he know that one day, he would find himself in an alternate world. Back to the present, Kiro wakes up in Shiro's lap. Turns out that he collapsed earlier, and she didn't have the heart to leave him behind. Hence, she brought him to the Drop of Life Pavilion. Looking around, he wonders if he will meet reincarnated people like him. Shortly, some guy approaches Kiro, calling his stats weird. Shiro then joins his company, claiming that he thought of her as the cover girl of the bar. Well, she actually works and stays there at the same time. Their conversation shifts to Toa, with Shiro stressing that Kiro kept mumbling her name while he was asleep. As they share the same surname, she believes Toa might be a family. With a deadpan expression, Kiro confesses Toa was his sister who died five years ago. Since his new world is where unhappy people are reborn, he genuinely hopes to stumble upon his sister. Much to his delight, Shiro has heard of the name Toa. 
Before he gets all worked up, she explains Toa isn't an uncommon name, and that people usually change their names after getting isekai'd. Hence, there is no guarantee that his sister lives there. Despite the uncertainty, Kiro still wants to give it a try. Shiro continues by mentioning four people who share the same name as his sister. Firstly, there's a witch named Tori, who lives in the country of Mariku. Secondly, a great magician called Tawazu resides in the country of Yurusoto. There is also someone named Maidora, who leads the chivalry in the country of Jedandora. Lastly, dubbed as the appointed red hero, Toi can be found in the country of Darudo. When Kiro asks if Shiro has any idea about their appearances and ages, she nods, although she's unsure about their ages. Shiro notes that time passes at different rates in his previous and current world. After contemplating, he decides to meet the person named Toei first. Shiro warns him that it will be difficult, to which he replies he will be fine going alone. She then speaks about being a hero, and points out that when visitors are reincarnated, they receive a status adjustment. Basically, a person might be blessed as a talented magic user or be granted an incredibly strong body. Out of all the visitors, there is a portion that receives excellent adjustments. As such, they use such power to make large contributions to the nation. By any chance, when an achievement receives recognition from the royal family, the recipient will be awarded a medal of honor or a noble ranking. To put it simply, a hero is someone who has protected Arcalia's peace since the mythic times. Kira then asks what type of contribution she is referring to. For starters, she tells him the minimum requirement, and that is by conquering a dungeon. There are monsters living in the dungeons where set trials await an adventurer. By defeating a particular enemy, one will receive a magic tool that houses immense power. If he offers a valuable item to the country, he will receive honor and invitations from other heroes. However, there are also demons in the dungeon that Shiro herself doesn't want to run into. As Kira digests all the information, she gives him a pair of contact lenses. Shiro makes it clear that it's not to make his eyesight better, but it will help him big time. As soon as he wears them, his jaws drop open when he sees user interfaces. Shiro states that it's called a direct glasses device, which allows its user to get a peek at someone's personal information. The device can also project documents and capabilities for sending and receiving messages. He is pretty convinced that it works like in games. Shiro then asks him to check his stats and information, and the reaction on his face says it all and the screen displays his own details. She shares that everyone starts off at level 1, but it can be noted that his stats are quite high for a beginner. He finally understands why the man from earlier reacted the way he did. From his proficient magical attribute black, to the cursed sinful deed, the divine protection eternal prayer, draws his attention. Shiro explains that there's a god in their world, and that divine protection works like the concept of guardian spirit. She notes that there's a god named Toa, and he had the divine blessing even before he was reincarnated. In connection as a recipient, he will be granted a maximum survival rate. At that point, Kira realizes that his sister has prayed for him to continue living, and she has been with him all along. Shiro alerts him that even though he has divine protection, conquering a dungeon could still lead him to his death. Even so, he has no plan to back down as he promises to reunite with Toa at all costs. To begin his new journey, Kiro learns more about Darudo, the nation centered on the continent of Arcalia. The place is abundant in natural resources, and its prosperity is maintained by the heroes. Starting in Jerushiasu, the country's royal capital, Kiro marvels at the sight of the buildings until Shiro calls for his attention. From the looks of it, he decided to let her join him in his pursuit. Since it will be troublesome if they get separated, she extends her hand, leaving him wondering if it's really necessary. Even though he is being treated as a kid, he takes her hand, and they stroll around the town. They drop by a weapon and armor store where Kiro puts on a new fit. Sporting his adventurer look, he asks Shiro if the gear he is wearing will be enough for dungeon clearing. She stresses that he should be fine since he's the one in gear, and he's going to take part in beginner-level dungeons anyway. She adds that with his current stats, even if he gets hit by Trutkun, he will not die and get isekai'd again. For their next stop, they enter a magic equipment store. She suggests asking the store manager to help Kiro understand how his black magical attribute works. Once inside, a baldy enthusiastically greets Shiro, congratulating her for finally finding a man. After clearing up the misunderstanding, the baldy introduces himself as Juru. Kiro then asks him what's the difference between the magic equipment they would get inside the dungeon and the one he is selling. Juru takes out a sample known as Sheets, an artificial magic equipment. Once a person melts the sheets into his mouth, he will obtain a magic skill. Judging by his reaction, Juru suggests he try it outside to prove his claim. Later on at the magic training area, Kiro consumes all the sheets. 
The magic formula pops up inside his head, and Drew asks him to activate the wind attribute first. Getting in the zone, he commands the air and successfully conjures up wind magic on his first try. Shiro tells him to proceed with water magic and aim for the blowing leaves. A few seconds later, he effortlessly hits his target with water. After that, Drew advises him to try some of his other stuff, but it seems like he isn't done yet. By combining wind and water magic, he is able to freeze a floating leaf, leaving the two spectators impressed. Talking to himself, Hiro admits he's getting the hang of it. Before they leave the store, Drew shares that he doesn't have any idea about his black magical attribute, but he will let him know once he has the information. Still holding each other's hands, Hiro apologizes to Shiro for paying for all the items he shopped for. She tells him not to sweat it because he will pay her back once he's already earning from defeating monsters. To add, the interest accumulates over 10 days. Suddenly, Shiro panics when she remembers she needs to buy something for someone. In haste, she leaves Kiro for a moment, asking him to wait for her until she arrives. He would have wanted to help her go shopping, but she did not let him speak. And so, Kiro finds himself alone, prompting him to think things over. As he puts it, he is definitely not on Earth, and Arcelia's reality revolves around adjustments, divine intervention, magic, and whatnot. While he imagines seeing his sister again, someone interrupts him. Turns out that it's a girl, asking him if he is the most recent visitor. Her eyes immediately capture his attention as he finds them beautiful yet dark. When Kiro asks about her identity, she asks him to inspect her. Looking at her stats, he figures that her name is Quenti and she belongs in the hero class. This leaves him thinking that she is the same as Toei, the hero he is searching for. Checking his details back, Quenti mentions that his stats are high for a beginner. He changes the topic and points out that heroes like her are amazing because they are able to maintain the country's peace. As if she flips a switch, Quenti states that they slay demons, acquire magic tools, and subjugate enemies because they are heroes. Ultimately, they talk about his rare magical attribute. According to Quenti, fire and water attributes are the common attributes. That said, she doesn't possess the natural ones because she holds the white magical attribute. She notes that she's just like Kiro, and there's a high probability that they are the strongest color attribute holders to be born in Arcelia. All this time, Quenti believed she was alone, and that she was the only one special until she met Kiro. She declares that in no time, he will surely be worshipped by the people just like her. He then asks her if quitting being a hero has ever crossed her mind. He adds that it's okay to run away if she desires to. Quenti reveals that Kiro is the first person who told him that. With the way she spoke about a hero's duty, he claims she sounded bitter. Even though he doesn't know much about her situation, he advises her to run away if she's being forced to do something, regardless if it troubles someone. In short, Hiro tells her to do what she likes. Quenti admits she wouldn't know what to do once she finally abandons her duty. For that, he asks her to worry about it once she has run away. It appears that the pep talk works as she cracks a relieved smile. Just then, Shiro arrives, and when he's about to introduce Quenti, she vanishes into thin air. He refuses to talk about meeting her, leaving Shiro clueless about his first encounter with a hero. Unfortunately, he missed the opportunity to ask about Toei. Sometime later, at the outskirts of a dungeon, the guards inform the duo that another party has already entered the area. They warn them to be careful as they finally get their chance to siege a dungeon together. Before they take the first step, Shiro announces that there's no such thing as revival magic in his new world, which makes one's death inevitable. Since it's Shiro's first time, she tells him they won't go too far in the dungeon. With that, they jump straight into the deep hole. As it seems, there are scattered dungeons across Arcelia, and these can be classified into two types. The first one is known as the Holy Shrines or the Territory of Gods where the Angel's Trial awaits. The second one is called the Demon Grounds that lead towards Deep Abysses. This is the territory of the demons and where monsters are born. Speaking of which, they enter the Zest, the Fire Element Demon Ground. As Kiro keeps his guard down, Shiro warns him that just because they are on the first floor, doesn't mean they won't come across some monsters. Following her revelation, the monsters are desperate to reach the surface to invade the people's domain. Since they are a threat to mankind's safety, raiders step in to protect the people. The monsters are being suppressed at fixed intervals, and the country gives reward money to those who defeat them. With the lenses capable of recording visual data, the authorities can confirm the kill. Minutes later, Kiro just runs into his first sighting of a monster, particularly a small one. The one-eyed monster bears its sharp teeth and attacks him. With little to no effort, Kiro gets rid of his first target. While he's having a main character moment, Shiro alerts him for the next one. Known as Kekura as his next prey, they can shoot out fire pillars from whatever they touch. 
As they continue to burn the ground, Hiro freezes their bodies. Shiro praises him for his performance as a newbie, even calling him extraordinary. For all that, their quest is far from over as more monsters enter the scene. This is the part where Shiro joins the fun as she displays her combative skills, taking down a number of enemies. In a short while, she notices Kiro is being surrounded by the much larger monsters. Now wielding a sword, he uses endowment magic, making his weapon sharper and stronger. With Toa's image in mind, he eliminates the monsters with powerful strikes. After the flashy execution, Shiro asks Kiro if he used to be some type of soldier in his previous life. In a sense, he claims he was kind of a hoodlum. Talking to himself, Kiro is well aware that he did better than he expected at his first actual battle with monsters. Soon afterward, a notification pops up, and he discovers that he just leveled up a notch. As they walk further, they reach the fourth floor. Shiro states that for a first-timer, Kiro has already gone far, so they can call it a day. As expected, he wants more action. She shares that of all the people she guided in dungeon clearing, he's the first person who has so much enthusiasm. As she makes it clear that she's confident that Kiro can still explore the labyrinth further, he suddenly lifts her body with a princess carry. With Shiro blushing in the background, he rears her up and apologizes for only thinking about himself and not considering her stamina. Hence, he finally agrees to call it quits. Upon noticing her crimson dyed cheeks, she begs him to put her down already. At that instant, they hear a rumbling sound down below. Shiro speaks about the party that went in before them, so she asks Kiro to head back first. Alone, she wants to check the other party's current situation, but he simply won't allow her. He reiterates that he was not a decent man before, and he has no plan of becoming one in his present life. Even so, he will act based on what he thinks is right, and letting her go alone feels wrong. Before they go down, Shiro asks him to promise her to follow her instructions, and so he does. It did not take long until they reached the sixth floor. As they discuss what could be the other party's objective for exploring the deep part of the dungeon, they see burnt bodies. Looking around, more victims come into view until a massive silhouette greets them. Once the smoke dissipates, it reveals a memios, the dungeon boss, and the monster that holds the magic tool. His eyes widen in shock when he notices that two kids are standing before the monster. Shortly, a man with hideous bangs tells the children to buy him more time as he prepares his magic equipment. While Kiro wonders why the man is standing too far from the kids, Shiro explains that he is a nobleman commanding his slaves. Indeed, the slave system also exists in Arculia, and the poor ones have no choice but to obey their master's absolute orders. It appears that the nobleman brought his slaves over to the dungeon to use them as tools. In doing so, he will acquire the magic equipment and raise his reputation as well. One of the kids charges at the monster, only to be dealt with, with one strike. With fear in her eyes, the remaining kid can only watch her friend slowly succumb to his death. Enraged, the nobleman commands the girl to use magic to draw the monster's attention. In the middle of the dire situation, he reminds her that her life means nothing. Trying to muster courage, she finds herself frozen in fear as the loud roar of the monster pierces her ears. Thankfully, Kiro interferes, and with one swing of his word, the Memios loses its right hand. With the girl still in shock, Shiro praises the flawless execution of his surprise attack. Before the situation gets out of hand, they decide to escape the place. When Kiro asks how the girl is doing, the monster breathes fire, pushing them back. For what it's worth, he asks if they pissed their enemy off after cutting its arm. With the Memios refusing to let them leave in peace, Kiro aims to finish it off. He summons multiple ice lances at once, but it's no use. Just when he believes that it's only his sword that can deal damage to the monster, it regenerates a new hand. While thinking of the best counter move, the nobleman interrupts him, accusing him of stealing away his spotlight and would-be achievement. Fuming, Kiro stares daggers at the noble guy, and the latter can't believe he's being treated as such. As he blabs on and on about his aristocratic blood, the Memios releases its spikes, sending the nobleman flying into midair. Kiro takes advantage of his speed as the monster continues to blast range attacks. Looking for an opening, he figures its blind spot and targets its neck. Just as he's about to deliver the decisive blow, his opponent dodges his attack. With its heavy tail, the monster sends him crashing into the rock formations. And just like that, the worried Shiro witnesses the MC getting beaten by his enemy. Out of nowhere, Kiro finds himself in an unknown space. There, he sees Toa in tears. He is about to tell her something, but she slowly drifts away until she completely disappears. Upon gaining his consciousness back, he stares at the monster in awe, overwhelmed at its power as a magic tool holder. Unfortunately for the entitled nobility, he just became the Memios's meal. Kiro believes he will be next in line, but he has no plan of giving up. 
As he gathers all the strength left in his body, a dagger lands on the monster's left eye. While it's distracted from the pain, Shira rushes to check on Kiro. She then applies her radiance healing to him, but it only works as first aid. She says that she hid the little girl on the upper floor, and that they will flee the dungeon once he can move again. Kiro instructs her to run away and leave him behind, but she refuses. He tries to reason out with her, stressing that she has done enough as his guide. Shiro states that she had seen other visitors who shared the same eyes as him. That said, they are currently living normal and happy lives. Truth be told, Arculea might be the world where lonely people are reincarnated, but it's also the place that makes people change for the better. With tears welling up in her eyes, she urges Kiro to be happy. Just then, the monster approaches them, throwing Shiro out of the picture. Due to her healing magic, he can now somehow move but then, he doesn't have any weapon with him. While figuring out the best course of action, he receives a message from Juru. The man informs him that he just found a description of his black magical attribute dated back to the mythic times, although limited. As per his research, black combines everything and converts it to power for the user. As the message draws to a close, Juru asks him to drop by his shop again. Standing back up, he vows to revisit the magical equipment store, help the little girl, and repay the money he borrowed from Shiro. Ironically enough, he has always wanted to kick the bucket, but now, he wants to live and experience more things. Inside a black circle giving off a menacing aura, Kiro sets his eyes on his prey. Looking at it, Shiro realizes that she might have misunderstood his color attribute. Aside from obtaining magic from the artificial magic equipment, those gifted with natural attributes must have a deep understanding of their power to create magic. In Kiro's case, he, as the user, determines how he expresses his color attribute. And so, he freely chooses the form of his black magical attribute. Known as Annex, the power to gather darkness and govern it, the gods bestowed upon an incredible power to Kiro. With Juru's help, he is able to shape the magic to what he wishes. By activating darkness unification, he transforms, covered in black armor. This grants him more power as his skill set acquires additional abilities. Watching Kiro from a distance, Shiro does not know exactly what to feel because he looks sinister. With the latter in a safe spot, he decides to go all out. The Memios charges at him, but he immediately restrains it with his black burial. In a snap, Kiro obtains the monster's abilities, including its regeneration ability. Using it to his own benefit, he heals his wounds in mere seconds, shocking Shiro. Seeing the monster still alive, he creates a sword out of darkness. The Memios answers it by breathing fire, but it's a futile effort. Through his annex, the darkness swallows the monster's magical fire. It launches more spikes directed at him, but he manages to evade them all. The monster attempts to pin him down again with its tail, but he says no, not this time. He cuts down its tail, and for his finishing move, he activates Dark Eater and obliterates his enemy. After that, the darkness absorbs the remaining body parts of the monster, hence increasing his power. Consequently, the magic tool appears in the form of a ring. He then wonders if it's enough to meet the heroes. As he muses on what to do with the valuable item, Shiro and the little girl walk toward him. He sets aside the magic tool for the time being to focus on what's in front of him. Hiro checks on the kid, who unhesitatingly asks him to make her his slave. From mentioning that she can do menial tasks and use a variety of magic, she points out that as a girl, she can be of use to him in some other things. She pleads with Kiro to consider her until she passes out from exhaustion. When he asks what they should do about the kid, Shiro shares that when a slave owner passes away, the ownership is transferred to the relatives. Having said that, she wonders if they can nullify or postpone the transference of ownership. With the reward money, Shiro believes they might pull things off. When asked about his opinion, Kiro declares they do what they can to protect the kid. Grinning, Shiro insinuates that he isn't really a bad guy, which he was trying to portray himself as. After resting for a bit, the duo and the kid leave the dungeon at once. A few days later, at the Northern Demon Ground rest, a party of two raiders clears the dungeon. The short-haired girl then speaks about the newcomer who defeated the Memios in the Demon Ground near the capital city. It piques the long-haired girl's interest, although she hopes that the promising newcomer is a girl. As she puts it, she despises guys for being savage creatures. Well, she expected her to say that, calling her Toa. Back at the inn, Kira watches over the little girl, still asleep. Meanwhile, at the pub, they hold a party for his achievement in getting the magic tool as a newcomer. When Kiro joins them, he asks Shiro if it's appropriate to be spending money on such celebrations. She says it's fine because the pub is grateful to have him. He stresses that a simple thank you would have been enough. After a while, the drunk Juru approaches him, asking him if he's drinking. Kiro takes the opportunity to thank him for his help, 
to which he says it's no big deal. Juru then claims that with his stats alone, he would have still defeated the dungeon boss, even without Shiro's help. He makes it clear that she has always helped him out, not just in dungeon clearing. Suddenly he carries Shiro, telling her she looks tired. They gasp at the sight, and for getting the wrong idea, someone even balls his eyes out. And so, she gives Kiro a solid punch in the face. No matter how many times Shiro tries to clear the air, they won't stop teasing her. Looking at people flocking together as they make so much noise, feels kind of nostalgic for Kiro. That is until a girl breaks his reverie, saying that Shiro is a popular girl. She adds that she wonders if she's lonely because she can't commit to one person. Called Vinny, she introduces herself, and he does the same, even sharing the floor he's staying at the inn. She reveals that she already knows it because he has become famous around the area. They talk about the ceremony for the magic tool offering that will take place in a week. Until then, he wants to do a lot of sightseeing. After the chit-chat, Vinny tells him he can always ask her if he wants to know anything. There and then, he questions what kind of person Chiro is. Before he gets misunderstood again, he clarifies that he only wants to know more about her as to why she is a guide in the first place. As someone who has been the recipient of her kindness and generosity, he badly wants to return the favor, not only in terms of money. Vinny suggests he spend more time with Shiro, and that he should ask her directly. Speaking of the devil, she calls for him and leads her elsewhere. Unbeknownst to him, Shiro is about to show the makeover she did for the sleigh girl. There she goes, Ikona, who now looks like a completely different person. In another flashback, the duo successfully convinced the head of the noble's family to pass Ikona's ownership into their hands. They discovered that the nobleman who died acted in his own will, and his father agreed to it because he thought he was only raiding a dungeon by himself. Once the nobles left, Hiro asked the girl's name, to which she said she was number 38. He asked again and she finally revealed her real name Ikona. By that time, they told the girl that they would not make her a slave, instead, she would have to work in the pub. In addition, Kiro mentioned that he wanted to be her friend. For being treated inhumanely by her former master, Ikona couldn't help but feel emotional after hearing such words. As a slave and an orphan who witnessed the death of her parents before her very eyes, she confessed that she had no idea what to do in her life anymore. For this reason, they promised to help her figure things out. Back to the present, Ikona swears to do her best at the pub. She expresses her gratitude to Kiro, addressing him as her master, but he refuses to be called such. Now that they have become friends, he tells her it's okay to call him by his first name. Looking at Ikona, smiling from ear to ear as she works, Hiro finds another reason to protect the people who can't protect themselves. Later on, a big guy named Tega enters the pub, seemingly in a terrible state. He passes out, and everyone rushes to help him. Once he regains consciousness, Kiro asks about his identity. Turns out that Tega is also a raider and a regular in the pub. Shiro states that his party consisted of five members, and they went out to challenge the guardian or the monster that received the favor of the evil god. Seeing Tega coming back alone, she fears that his comrades might have not made it. The guardian is said to be the magic tool holder in the deepest part of the demon ground. With the monster possessing a ridiculous power, the country would normally send heroes to hunt it down. The dejected Tega admits they were foolish to think they could stand up against the guardian. He recalls the terrifying encounter revealing that the monster toyed with them, although it could have easily killed them from the get-go. Known as Saigiru, it's a vicious guardian that resides in the deepest part of the Green Dungeon. When asked why he's the only one who escaped, Tega confesses that Saigiru left him alive. He helplessly watched three of his comrades pass away in front of him. Strangely enough, the monster grabbed the woman named Kirara, who's still alive, until they disappeared into the darkness. Desperate to save his friend, he begs them to cast healing magic on him so he can return to the dungeon. They protest against his idea, claiming it won't do him any good because it will take time to restore his magic power. Even though there's a high chance that Kirara has also breathed her last, Tega wishes to at least recover his comrades' bodies. Barely gathering his wits, he vows to challenge Saguru once more. Hearing this, Kiro steps out and volunteers to enter the green dungeon in his stead. The next morning, Tega wonders why Kiro seems unfazed by the traumatic experience he shared yesterday. The former asks the MC if he's really sure about coming along, to which he says he can pay him back after with a round of beer. Once they settle everything, they set forth to the green dungeon. Sporting a new outfit, Kiro thanks Shiro for providing him with a coat made of magic-resistant materials. He then mutters why she has to join them and put herself in danger. Shiro says she personally knows Tega's comrades because she was once their guide. She couldn't stomach sitting around and doing nothing for them. 
From being worried about Shira's safety, Ikona catches up to them and requests she join the rescue operation too. Hiro tells Shiro and Teda to go on ahead as he knocks some sense into Ikona's head. He makes it clear that where they are heading is far more dangerous than the last dungeon they went into. Feeling embarrassed, Ikona says she only wants to be of help because she is indebted to them. All of a sudden Kiro asks her if she likes fish. Contrary to the individuals in his previous world, the people of Daruto don't often eat fish. With that, he asks Ikona to add fish to the menu at the pub. Her mood instantly changes as she assures Kiro that she will come up with delicious fish dishes. Thankfully, she stops asking him to join them and tells Kiro to be careful on their quest. Just then, a familiar voice catches his attention as he follows Shiro and Tega. It's none other than Quenti, asking him if he's going to another dungeon. He says sorry because he needs to get going. It's not the right time to get into a conversation, but she questions why he has to enter the green dungeon. Quenti stresses that she understood his objective when he went into the zest, but this time, she wonders if he's doing it to become a hero. Clenching his fist, Kira declares he has no interest in becoming a hero. She says that Tega and his party deserved what happened to them for challenging the Guardian despite being weaklings. Hiro brushes her statement aside and tells her that even though there's a slim chance that Kirara is still alive, he still wants to try. Aside from pointing out that it's the right thing to do, he can't just ignore the free beer he will chug once everything's over. Shiro then shouts at him for taking so much time. And just like before, Quenny vanishes without a trace. At that moment, he hears a warning about his color attribute not being an invincible tool. As such, if used without practicing caution, his own magic might eat him up. Upon their arrival at their destination, the duo learns that they can locate Sagiru in the deepest area, the 13th floor. For the second time, Tega asks Kuro if he wants to do it, annoying him a little. As they walk further into the dungeon, they are surprised to see plants growing everywhere befitting what the place is called. Kuro notices that the insides of the dungeon cannot be compared to its surface. As opposed to the zest, the green dungeon houses intermediate level monsters, meaning they are much stronger. That said, they easily shatter them into pieces. Shiro talks with the monsters, reminding them she is not their enemy. She's enjoying herself until a huge centipede interrupts her. As she's scared stiff of the bugs, she runs for her life, signaling Tega to jump in, slicing them up. Unwilling to waste their time battling small fry, he instructs them to follow him. However, he notices Kiro literally just standing like a statue as the monsters surround him. Without laying a finger on any of the enemies, the darkness saves Kiro the trouble of eliminating them. Witnessing how the monsters have been taken care of in one go, Tega notes that his black attribute somewhat differs from what's told in the heroic tales. He explains that there is a book titled The Heroic Tale of the Great War Between Humans and Demons. The content talks about a squad of heroes who fought an evil god. Among them is one of the popular characters called the Black Hero. Shiro is actually aware of it, although she didn't think it was worth mentioning to Kiro, since the author only used his imagination in Black Hero's depiction. As per the author's view, he is a fair and righteous person who fights demons to protect humans. Needless to say, Kiro admires the Black Hero but he also knows that they are completely different because he only does things as he pleases. Seeing him laughing, Teda can't comprehend his antics. In relation to the story, he adds that the white hero loses her memory, and the black hero loses himself. Based on the book, the citizens of Daruto greatly supported the heroes who fought the demons. The story itself guides inspiration from the scriptures of Arculia. While there are many differences between the two, one notable difference is the hero's death. Following the book, the two heroes sacrifice their lives to win against the evil god. In the scriptures, the mysterious black hero and the other person were never described in detail. Meanwhile, the monsters won't stop coming, leaving the trio stuck at their place. Having had enough of their numbers, Hiro conjures up the Dark Eater and eliminates all the monsters on the floor. Shiro can't help but praise him for understanding how magic works in a short amount of time. He then notices that the mental pollution in his user interface is steadily moving up. While he wonders what it exactly means, Shiro volunteers to heal his wound, even though he can now do it himself. She says thank you to him, claiming she and Tega wouldn't have made it far if he didn't accompany them. As she tells him they will surely bring back Kurara and the others, Hiro learns that the status of his mental pollution has gone down. At that point, he decides to put it aside. Soon enough, they reach the 13th floor, where the gate is left open. As soon as they walk inside, Shiro spots Kurara sitting on the ground. They urgently run toward her, with Tega asking if she's okay and apologizing for leaving her behind. Acting as if with a screw loose, Kurara greets them as she smiles and cries at the same time. 
Just then, the place lights up, and an ominous voice welcomes their arrival, even congratulating them for making it far. In a trice, the atmosphere gives off great hostility and tension as Sagiru comes into sight. Hiro can't believe that the monster before him can speak and communicate with them. Outraged by Kirara's current condition, Tega launches an attack, but the Guardian easily restrains him with its many tree ponds. The monster recognizes him, thanking him for carrying out his purpose by bringing his friends. Before the vines rip his arms apart, he manages to break free, but the many trees are left unscathed. Looking at one of them closely, he realizes it's one of his comrades, Hirusu. Shiro reminds Tega to keep his guard until something, someone rather, emerges from the ground, it's Hana. Laughing maniacally, Sagiru asks what they think about its artistic creations. It appears that the monster embedded its sapling into the human corpses, and thus, gave rise to his new puppets. With the unstable Kirara in the corner, Tega's former party members charge at them. The latter can't bring himself to hurt his friends as he tells them to snap out of it. Shiro reminds him that they are already dead until one of them smacks her to the ground. Hirusu and Hana prey upon her, but Kiro steps in just in time to save her. While Tega goes frantic as his friend's bodies get severely damaged, Hiro shares that the darkness is swallowing their remains, and they can still hold a funeral later. Seeing Tega struggling to keep his composure, he reminds him that he came back to the awful place to rescue Kirara. Hearing this, the Guardian makes his move to stop them, and so does Kiro, who wraps his body in black armor. He wields his sword and attacks the monster, but the vines get in his way. Saiguru eventually realizes that he is a black attribute user. For playing with people's lives, Kiro itches to bid Saiguru good riddance. All the while, the digits in his mental pollution keep increasing. Standing face to face with the Guardian, Kiro battles with a stronger opponent. Saiguru unleashes more vines, only for them to be chopped down. Fuming at how a human holds the power of the black attribute, Saiguru controls more puppets, including Mio, one of Tega's friends. By casting the same spell, Black Burial, the mini trees can't even land a scratch on his body. Even so, the status of his mental pollution is getting more alarming. While Saiguru thinks of his next move, Shiro urges Kiro to retreat since they have already rescued Kirara and retrieved their comrades' bodies. Unwilling to let the monster get away after all its atrocities, Kiro instructs Tega to take the girls with him and head back to the town. He makes it clear that he's not doing it for him, but out of his own desire to kill Saiguru, Shiro calls his name, but it looks as though he can't hear anything as he goes berserk. Amidst the intense fight, the monster takes delight in witnessing how the feelings of anger consume Kiro. Upon seeing an entrance, Saiguru lands a solid hit on his body, leaving him coughing up blood. The Guardian hurls his body and he crashes to the ground. The extreme discomfort somehow wakes him up as he tries to settle his nerves. He then reminds himself not to act rashly just like what he did with his successful revenge. Soon afterward, he finds his bearings and looks at his opponent straight in the eyes. For all that, Kuro abruptly stops walking towards Saiguru, prompting the latter to mock him. Little did he know, he was aiming for an ambush attack. As a result, he manages to set the monster's body on fire. Saiguru acknowledges his quick judgment, but even so, the magical fire's level will not suffice. While the monster is right about it, Kiro reveals the trick up his sleeve. He restrains its body by recreating the Guardian's own magic and using it against it. Cornered, Saiguru suggests they talk things out calmly. Kiro, not batting an eyelid, declares he is calm and leaves the monster screaming with his Dark Eater. As his mental pollution continues to rise, the Guardian's remains are scattered everywhere. Shiro and Tega rejoice at his feet, but he tells them it's not over yet. With its head still intact, Saiguru provokes Kiro, who is slowly going mad. Just when they think that the Guardian is already done for, the ground shakes as the vines come out of it. With no intention to acknowledge defeat, the Guardian calls upon something that will claim their lives. The four survivors look up as something massive slowly descends into the dungeon. Turns out that the ball of flame is the sun itself. Saiguru explains that in the same way plants need sunlight to grow, the monsters also need it because it has always been the core of the green dungeon. As the source of life, even though Saiguru withers and dies, new monsters and a guardian will arise. To make matters worse, the sun can also burn the monster's enemies into ashes. Before the sun gets nearer, Shiro shatters the vines and asks Kuro to escape the place. However, the monster is a step ahead as it closes the gate. Saguru bursts out laughing, saying that whether or not they keep the Guardian alive, they will face their demise. As Saguru tells them to perish with its body in the dungeon, Hiro asks the monster to die by itself. With the serious injury he suffered from Saguru's attack, it slowly takes a toll on his body. 
Nonetheless, he swears to see another day with his friends. He launches an attack straight at the sun, but the darkness fails to devour it because of its overwhelming size. Kuro admits that even if the Dark Eater is capable of consuming the entire sun, it will take too long. Having said that, he continues to throw aggressive charges, leaving him bushed. Shiro tries to stop him, suggesting they break the gate instead and rush to the surface. Kuro stresses it's no use because they will only get burned alive before they make it out. For a moment he considers using his other attributes, but he knows that these won't outdo his black attribute. Desperate to take the sun out, Kuro prepares to deal another strike to it. That is until his mental pollution reaches a new peak, rendering him paralyzed. Elsewhere, Kuro finds himself in a dark place. He remembers seeing his stats before what happened, making him think that it might be why he is there. Shortly he comes across a dark entity, to which his little sister tells him not to take another step. Toa warns her brother that he shouldn't unlock such power, because he would lose himself in the process. She notes that the dark entity holds a destructive power, so he must go back to avoid the worst case scenario. He then convinces himself that the Toa he is talking to is only an illusion created by his mind. Without enough time before the sun totally descends into the dungeon, Kuro decides to take a risk, for his friend's protection and his chance to reunite with his sister. By coming in contact with the dark entity, Kuro acquires a new magical skill. Just a few steps away from the green dungeon's entrance, Kwani turns up. She ponders why Kuro has to risk his life despite receiving a warning beforehand. By misusing the color attribute's power, he just brought himself to his own destruction. If anything, he successfully annihilates both Sagiru and the sun. After surviving the ordeal and believing that everything is over, Shiro calls for Kuro. He wonders who's calling him, and upon seeing their silhouettes, he thinks of them as his enemies. Luckily, Tager reacts quickly to save Shiro, as she almost gets slashed by the flying axe. After a while, the axe gets absorbed, leaving them thinking that if they recklessly move around, they might disappear into nothingness too. While Shiro tries to comprehend what's happening, Tega claims it's his fault for not disclosing the passage, saying that the white hero will lose her memory and the black hero will lose himself. He apologizes for keeping quiet and alerts Shiro that if he truly loses himself, then there's no guarantee that they will listen to them. Unperturbed by his revelation, she persuades him that it's going to be fine. As she puts it, Kiro is just a little lost and as his guide, she has a duty to fulfill. Tega notes that to bring the black hero back, he must be reminded of something precious to him. And so, Shiro walks straight into the darkness to wake him up. Once inside, she tries to avoid touching the black mist, but it's just impossible. As it leaves her skin with a stinging sensation, she worries that Kiro will blame himself. Trying to ignore the pain, Shiro realizes that he hasn't completely lost himself because the black mist did not eat her up. A few moments later, she catches sight of Kiro, kneeling on the ground. She approaches him, and asks if he can understand her, and if he still has self-awareness. In another dimension, the girl resembling Toa states that she knew she wouldn't be able to stop him from seeking help from the dark entity. She reveals that she went through all the trouble to look like his sister to protect him, but then she couldn't stop him. In spite of that, she's convinced that he won't die until he finds the real Toa. The girl reminds him that he won't be able to reunite with his sister if he doesn't free himself from the dark entity. Toa feels relieved when she hears Shiro's voice calling out to him. She shares that she's safe with Teva and Kirara, and they are waiting for him to return. While Kiro faintly remembers who they are, Shiro reminds him that Ikoma has prepared him a meal. She also mentions that his main goal is to search for Toa. The girl then asks Kiro about the identity of the person trying so hard to reach him. Little by little, he starts to recognize her voice as the black barrier cracks. She refuses to give up on him until her desperate efforts pay off. Kiro breaks out of the dark entity's grip, saying that he remembers her, the girl who never fails to remind him to be happy, Chiro. In tears, she feels glad that Kiro is back. Ultimately, the black mist disappears, and a blinding light shines upon the duo. Tega is so happy to see them as they return back to normal, exchanging banters. Later that day, they finally head back to the inn where a grand seafood banquet, Karavikona, awaits them. Some time passed since the green dungeon incident, a guest arrived at the inn. Kiro steps out of his room and bumps into Tega. Giving himself a respite after fighting two villains, he gulps a cold beer paired with Ikona's new specialty. Kiro then asks how Kirara is doing, to which he says she is still recovering through a magic healer's help. Tega takes his chance to thank him again as they were able to hold a proper funeral for his fallen comrades. He then asks him about the status of his mental pollution. Kiro states that it's holding steady at a low level. He adds that he should be fine as long he doesn't overuse his black attribute. Even so, he's thinking of consulting magic healers, 
or anyone knowledgeable in the same field. He notes that he can't afford to lose himself again because Shira won't always be around to save him. Tega speaks about another passage in the scriptures. He says that the black hero needs both loved ones and comrades to fight alongside him. They both wonder which category Shiro falls into. Setting this topic aside, Hiro asks him what they should do with the magic tool they got from Sagiru. He says he has already gotten what he needed with the valuable item from Memeos. When he suggests selling the magic tool to help finance Kira's medical needs, Tega appreciates the offer, but he turns it down. As a fellow raider, he stresses that he also has his pride, and it is crystal clear that Kiro was the one who defeated Sagiru. He points out that he has a responsibility to fulfill towards his comrades and that Kiro, lending him a hand to avenge them is more than enough. After a while, Tega says it's time for him to go. They both agree to see each other again, with Tega promising he will surely treat him next time. As someone tagged as the Black Hero, Hiro considers Tega as one of the comrades he would fight alongside with. Just as he leaves, Shiro states that she feels relieved seeing Tega moving forward after his loss. Hiro shares the same sentiments and adds that with an incredible guy like him around, Kiro will fully recover in no time. Later that night, Shiro takes out a box where Kiro's ceremonial clothing is being kept. She asks him to try it on, and the girls simp over him for looking like a Prince Charming. While he wonders how expensive his outfit is, Shiro informs him that the Red Hero will attend the ceremony. After clearing dungeons and collecting magic tools to be used as offerings in the upcoming ceremony, Hiro anticipates meeting Toei. Soon enough, the day for the ceremony finally arrives, taking place in Darudo Founding Memorial Hall. As soon as he steps inside, he gasps in amazement at how grand the ceremony is. A girl in eyeglasses then approaches him and introduces herself as Pirasu, the first lieutenant. Claiming that she has heard a lot about the Black Hero, she says it's an honor to finally meet him. Kiro tries to act clueless about the epithet she called him, although he admits he has heard of it in some heroic tales. Pirasu speaks about how Kiro is the first person in a thousand years to be blessed with the Black Attribute. It goes without saying that if he meets the royal family, there's a high chance he will be granted citizenship status, a relic, and be formally introduced as a hero. Well, despite the power he would get, Kiro is not interested in all of it. To convince him, Pirasu highlights that when he becomes a hero, he will be seen as an equal to the aristocrats and indulge in the same privileges. She adds that heroes also receive a considerable salary and that they will no longer be affected by the restrictions limiting normal citizens. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows because a hero will automatically be a part of the nation's military forces. No matter how high they are being put on the pedestal, if they receive an order to fight in the front lines, they have to obey it. Just then, Pirasu informs him that the blue hero Rukius has also graced the ceremony. Rumor has it that no one holds a candle to him when it comes to ice magic. As a gentleman with a dashing appearance and a noble status, Rukius has gathered fervent support from the general public. On the other hand, Irufi, the divine healing hero, is not only known for her top-notch healing magic but also for her combat prowess. However, she doesn't act very ladylike, which usually gets her into trouble. Looking at each one of them, Kiro notes they are for sure unique characters. To protect the hero's image, Pirasu declares that their competency on the battlefield makes up for their flaws. She continues and reveals that aside from him, there are seven heroes. Amongst them is the great hero who earned fame for single-handedly defeating several magic tool holders. Hearing all her stories, Kiro recalls Quenti's statement about them being the only two individuals possessing color attributes. He believes Rukius might also be a legit user of color attribute as the blue hero. Kiro then remembers the person he's been looking for, and in a flash, the red hero arrives. Rukius calls out Toa for being late, to which she says she had to deal with a bothersome dungeon boss on the way. The playful Irufi invites her for a drink, only to be told she prefers sweets to alcohol. With a striking resemblance to Toa, despite having longer hair and more mature facial features, Kiro is convinced that he's looking at his sister. He calls Toa, and she approaches him, but unfortunately, she doesn't know him. Later on, the hero appointment ceremony officially starts. Kiro has become a citizen of Darudo and a nation's hero to an extent. For all that, his mind seems preoccupied because of the reunion he had with Toa, which certainly was not how he imagined it would be. Toa asserted that they had never met before, and Kiro was left dumbfounded because his sister was obviously not playing with him. Indeed, Toa did not recognize him at all. No longer in the mood to talk with him, she walked away and asked Rukius to get her some juice. Interestingly enough, Irufi seems to know something, leaving Kiro dying of curiosity. 
She formally introduces herself to him and shares that she is also known as the magic healer. With her caliber, she specializes in tuning the mind. She explains that she helps calm down someone's mind disturbed by any stimuli. From the typical everyday stresses to the memories of a gruesome death, she can help anyone suffering from that range. As such, she would frequently treat the visitors of Arculia who mostly share a tragic past, and Toa was one of them. As a doctor, Irufi shouldn't disclose confidential information about her patients, but she decides to tell Toa's story. She arrived five years ago. After her admission, she was always in a state of panic. She was unstable as she would just scream for no apparent reason and would cry all day long. In between her sobs, she would mutter Ko-chan. Even though she was struggling mentally and emotionally, she did not miss out on any sessions for her treatment. When Toa finally calmed down one day, she asked Arufi to make her forget the past. The latter stated that there's no such thing as magic that could wipe out a person's memories. For this reason, she resorted to putting a lock on her mind. The lock seals the option of recalling certain memories. According to Irufi, she's not the only person who can break the lock, someone of her level can also do it. She notes that if Toa comes in contact with someone connected with the sealed memories, there's a tendency for the lock to open by itself. Even then, in her current state, Toa is now stable. She no longer has nightmares nor does she cry every single day. Upon hearing all that his sister has gone through, Kiro blames himself. Had he not chosen to hang out with his friends and accompany Toa instead, she wouldn't have died. The fact that his sister wanted to forget everything and she had to put her life in danger for being a hero, Kiro could only wish she could have had a better brother. Rukius then notices that he's acting a little strange. Pirasu checks on Kiro, but he says he's okay. Now that he has confirmed that Toa and Toa are the same person, he wonders what to do next. Torn between letting his sister live her life, without having the traumatic flashbacks and letting her remember that she has a brother, Kiro gives it a careful thought. While he's at it, Pirasu asks him to reconsider his decision about becoming a hero. Although he's been very vocal about not wanting to be one, the good deeds he did, namely rescuing a slave girl and the raiders in the green dungeon, his actions speak for themselves. Pirasu asks Kiro what's holding him back, but he refuses to answer it. Before she leaves him be, she tells him that she can't believe that there's someone like him who neither wants riches nor glory, but still puts the people's safety as the top priority. Sometime later, Kiro stumbles upon Toa. This time, he addresses her with appropriate honorifics and apologizes for his rude behavior earlier. She says it's all fine now because she doesn't hold grudges anyway. It's safe to say that he knows it too. Toa asks Kiro if he came from Japan because of his first name Kusuk, and he confirms it. After she introduces herself with her full name, Kiro changes a syllable in his last name. They then talk about their age and birth date and Toa realizes they share the same personal details. As she talks about them being like twins, Kiro can hardly contain his emotions. Seeing her smiling and moving and hearing her voice, he couldn't be any happier. An irritating voice interrupts their conversation, revealing a noble publicly humiliating his valet for messing up his drink. Kiro asks about his identity, to which Toa reveals that he's the Red Dawn hero Reiku. She alerts him not to bother with him until the man approaches Kiro. He expresses his delight in meeting the rumored black hero. Reiku then notices Toa beside him and accuses them of talking about him behind his back. If anything, she states that all she said about him is true. Reiku questions Kiro if he first appeared at the temple in the forest. He hasn't answered it yet when he asks him if he's acquainted with Shiro. Kiro says yes and shares that she is his guide. Reiku mentions that Shiro's mother was his guide back then. He states that they worked so hard to run the inn, while he was too busy with his hero duties. Hence, they became alienated from each other. While Kiro is baffled as to why Shiro never talked about her mother, Reiku tells him she did the right thing. Acting all high and mighty, Reiku announces that he's the one responsible for the death of Shiro's mother. With Kiro about to throw a fit after hearing his revelation, Reiku narrates what happened seven years ago, just like Kiro, he was also from a different world. Known as the one-man army, having a guide did not cross his mind. However, every time he went into the dungeons, Coco, Shiro's mother, would always tag along. The mother and daughter reincarnated to Arculia after an accident, and the former worked at a pub and served as the guide. Reiku found Coco as an annoying woman for being a busybody whenever he went to raid dungeons. After clearing several floors, she would always get in his way and stop him from going further into the deepest floors. Having had enough of her pestering, Reiku hatched an evil plan, like how some nobles treat their slaves. He used Coco as bait to secure a magic tool from a dungeon boss. When he returned to the pub with the magic tool and without Coco, Shiro confronted him. As she kept saying to bring her mother back, Reiku punched her. 
Fortunately, the ruffians inside the pub intervened before the situation grew any worse. Reiku could have easily taken down the ruffians, but he let them off the hook to avoid more trouble. Nevertheless, he admitted that if it weren't for Koko, he wouldn't have been a hero. With a villainous smirk, he asks Kiro how is Shiro doing, to which he answers it with a glare. Reiku taunts him even more, prompting Pirasu to interfere. She reminds Reiku not to cause a scene because they are celebrating the birth of a new hero. He orders her to shut up and stop shoving her nose into his business. Kiro then asks if he really laid a hand on Shiro. As a response, Reiku confesses that the look on her face with her nose bleeding was the most amusing. Things escalate quickly when Kiro gives in to his provocation, telling him to be his guest if he badly wants a fight. Since they can't be stopped, an exhibition match just got added to the ceremony. Rukius and Toa talk about how Reiku might get himself in trouble for facing the real deal. It appears that the other heroes only add color to their titles as per the nation's mandates. The truth of the matter is that only Quinty and Kiro possess the real color attributes, white and black, respectively. While Rukius has already a clear winner in mind, Reiku initiates the battle and summons the light of dawn that consumes everything. To counter it, Kiro activates Dark Eater, sending the battle arena turning black and white. Much to his shock, his attack didn't work on his light. As the impact of a hero's power pushes him to the edge, Reiku charges at him. Hiro manages to block his sword as Irufi cheers for him to crush his opponent's face. Reiku stresses that the result of their battle has already been determined because he is at level 56 while he's only at level 9. Although Kiro appears to be at a disadvantage, Toa claims that battles aren't decided by levels alone. Kiro acknowledges Reiku as a strong opponent, however, he relies too much on his strength. Suddenly, Reiku's cape gets caught up in fire. While he's distracted, Kiro wraps his body with vines. Before he can escape from the restraints, Kiro aims for his arm, although he's not sure if he slashes the arm that struck Shiro. 